as we continue, last Sabbath, Pastor Austin w walked us through the first angel's message. And just some highlights about, about that. <clears throat> if you're here, some things that were brought out, of course, what is that it's, an ever, it's the everlasting gospel that is to be preached to all the world. And that's a very important part, as we'll see in a little bit, as far as the second angel's message. But if you join me there in Revelation 14, we saw that it's the gospel to go to the entire world. The everlasting gospel. The good news that Jesus died for your sins and my sins. The good news that he only died once. The good news that we have salvation if we put our faith and trust in him. The good news that we have one mediator, and that's Jesus Christ. The good news that God saves us by Christ's righteousness, and not by our own righteousness. We also looked at what it, what it is to fear the Lord. There where the first angel's message says, fear God and give him glory. And besides fear the Lord representing as giving him reverence, Pastor Austin also showed us on how it represents obeying God. To fear God also means to obey God, to keep his commandments. And of course, to give him glory. And we looked at especially that in this first angel's message, the hour of his judgment has come. And Pastor Austin went over on how we are living in judgment time, judgment hour, right now. As you and I sit here, as we will go back home today, wake up tomorrow, we are living in judgment time. And that's very important as we see now the second angel's message. Let's so I just invite you to bow your head one more time as we pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you very, very much for the clarity of your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Revelation 14 verse 8 continues with saying, And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. My first question is, who is Babylon? And what does it mean that she's fallen? Because it repeats it twice. She's fallen, fallen, is fallen. So who, who, who is Babylon that, that has fallen down? Well, if you join me in Revelation 17... Revelation 17, it gives us a little more description about Babylon. <clears throat> and we're going to see that Babylon and the harlot described in Revelation 17 are the same, is the same one. There, Revelation 17, verse 1, it says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now don't miss that it's saying her fornication. And also the second angel's message talks about her fornication. Okay, so uh, verse 3 and 17. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast having on a scarlet beast which was full of the names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication that sounds just like the second angel, angel's message there in the second angel's message where Babylon is fallen, that great city, because she had made all the nations drink of the wine of her fornication. So here in 17 we see this woman sitting on a beast with a cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was given to her. And what's the name? Mystery, 
Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So there we see a description of Babylon. Now it's interesting that in the Old Testament, whenever it refers to Babylon, it is never, Babylon is never referred to as a harlot in the Old Testament. On the contrary, in the Old Testament, Babylon is always referred to the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, the country area of Babylon, the world as well as being Babylon. The only time in the Old Testament that uh, anything is portrayed as a harlot is the church, is Israel. In, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, harlot is applied to Israel, to God's people. You will find that in Ezekiel, you will find that in Jeremiah, how God is displeased with his people. And he says, you, you, you have played the harlot. And so, so then in Revelation 17, it combines both and is talking about the Christian church that has become Babylon. The, a Christian church that, has, that is playing the harlot. So it gives some, some, some characteristics there. One of them is that it is a church because we know that in Bible prophecy, a woman represents a church. So here, as I, as I mentioned early, where it describes as she, and also her name and, and on her forehead. So this woman sitting on this beast <clears throat> has to represent a church. A second characteristic is that it is a worldwide church. Notice there in 17 verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the harlot who sits on many waters. Who sits on many waters. And if you look at verse 15, verse 15. Of, the, of that same chapter, 17, it says, And he said to me, The waters which you saw where the, where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So it's a worldwide church, right? This, this, this harlot, this Babylon is worldwide. But notice, did you catch some, some similarities between, between where it sits and the first angel's messages? It sits on waters which are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the first angel's message is to go where? To every nation, tribe, tongues, and people. Everywhere, worldwide as well. So this first angel's message is also to, grow, is, is also to go worldwide. But we're still identifying who Babylon is. Another characteristic is that this church is involved with the kings of the earth. It's involved politically. We can see there that she fornicated, made, wine, made drunk with the kings of the earth. But most importantly, or maybe not most importantly, but a very important key to remember is that this woman has daughters. Has daughters. Notice there, Revelation 17, verse 5. What's her name? Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. If you cannot be a mother if you don't have children. So she is a mother of harlots, so she must... And then harlots implies daughters, women. So they, this woman has other daughters, or this church has other churches as well. So in some point of history, she begot daughters that share many of her teachings. Okay, this, this church, in some point of Earth's history, she begot daughters that share many of her teachings. And another characteristic, and I'm only going to go over five, is that this church is stained with the blood of the saints. You can see it there in verse 6. Revelation 17, verse 6, And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So there is 
by looking at these characteristics, who, ba who is Babylon? It's, it's pretty clear. And the characteristics only point to one worldwide church with these characteristics, which is none other than the Roman Catholic Church system. But it's not only fits that description. Because if you saw here, this, this, this woman has daughters as well, which are also Babylon. Okay, so Babylon isn't just one system or one church because she has daughters that are also playing the harlot and that are also part of Babylon. She has daughters which are also Babylon and Babylon is any church that gives the wine of, 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 um, of Babylon. So, so now I like to just go over what wine is it giving? And what, you know, I, so I looked up wine in the Bible and most of the references refer to the actual juice, the actual wine. But there in Revelation 17, verse 4, 17, verse 4, it says, The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a cup full of, but here it doesn't say wine. It says what? Abominations and the and the filthiness of her fornication. So here we can see that the wine that, this, that Babylon is making the world drunk with are the abominations. So let's look at what are the abominations according to God and the scripture. We're only going to look at a few. There are many. But turn with me to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Let's look at at what, abomin what God calls abomination. Because this is what Babylon is getting the world drunk with. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9. It begins and saying, When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn from the, from the abominations of the nations. Okay, here Israel is coming out of Egypt. Verse 10, There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. So from, from these verses here, what is the abomination here that Moses is talking about? In a nutshell, you can capture it all in the teaching of the immortality of the soul. Because you conjure up uh, you speak to the dead, you do witchcraft, you do sorcerers, or, sp or spells, or mediums, or spiritists, which all have to do in, a, in one way or another in connecting with the afterlife, or the dead. And here, God is telling His people, have nothing to do with that. Have nothing to do with that. And so we need to be careful. Any church that says that you don't really die, that you keep on living somewhere, that is an abomination to the Lord. And that is a wine that, that, that Babylon is feeding, is giving to drink the world. And God says, no, that is an abomination. The immortality of the soul. God has told us that, when, that the wages of sin is death death. How about uh, Proverbs chapter 28? Turn with, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 28. We will see another abomination there in Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28. We're looking at the wine that Babylon is getting the world drunk with. But praise the Lord that Babylon has fallen. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 9. 
The Bible says, one who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. One who turns away his ear from hearing the law. Saying, basically saying, you don't have to keep the law. Or maybe anyone that may say that the law was nailed to the cross. That is an abomination. God expects his people to keep the law, to love the law, to have the law in their heart. Where really the new covenant is the law is written in our hearts and not on tablets of stone. So here saying that the law was nailed to the cross or that the law is no longer important is part of the wine that Babylon gives. How about Luke chapter 16? Luke chapter 16. You see, if you do away with the law, then, then, then some may say, you know, it, the law doesn't matter. You will still be saved. But here in Luke chapter 20, no, I'm sorry, Luke 16. Luke 16 verse 15. Here Jesus tells us what else is an abomination. Luke 16 verse 15. Jesus says here, You are those who justify yourselves before men. But God knows your heart. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. It's an abomination in the sight of God. You see, people that say that you can be saved by your works. By your works. There, that's, what, that's what Jesus is talking about. You are those who justify yourselves before men. You are depending on your works. You are justified by your works. But God knows the heart for what is highly esteemed among men. If someone, if someone really has highly um, feelings about their work or about their holiness, maybe, here the Bible says that is an abomination in the sight of God. So you have both types. People that say you can be saved by your works is an abomination. But also people that say that you can be saved in your sins, the law doesn't matter, is also an abomination. Jeremiah chapter 13. Jeremiah chapter 13. We're going to see, and I'm going, all of these verses are also in the, in the bottom of your bulletin there. If you would like to study them at home, you can do that as well. But Jeremiah chapter 13 what else is an abomination? Jeremiah chapter 13 verse 26. The Bible says, Therefore I will uncover your skirts over your face, that your shame may appear. I have seen your adulteries and your lustful nays. Nanings, the lewdness of your harlotry, your abominations on the hills in the field. Woe to you, O Jerusalem, will you still not be made clean? Adultery or fornication, which is the same thing, is an abomination before the Lord. So anyone or any church that may be, you know, that may say, you know, it's okay to live together before you get married, that is an abomination. Sex before marriage is an abomination. It is adultery, it is fornication, and God says that is part of the wine that Babylon is getting the world drunk with. Deuteronomy 14 verse 3. I like this one. I think all of us in one way or, or another are guilty of this one. Deuteronomy chapter 14 verse 3. It is an abomination to think that we can eat or drink whatever we want. Deuteronomy chapter 14 verse 3. You shall not eat, you shall not eat any detestable thing. And then it goes on to list what is detestable. But, no, but on my Bible there where it says detestable, it has a little number and it gives another definition, which is the same word for abomination. 
Some of you may have a newer translation where it may say abomination. You shall not eat any detestable or abominable thing. Thinking that it doesn't matter what you eat. Those um, health laws were only for Israel. But we see that they're not. And actually the Bible tells us that everything, whether we eat or drink, that it may all be done to the glory of God. Not to the glory of my appetite or my tongue or my taste buds. And here in Jeremiah chapter 32, if we go back to Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 32, this is another abominable thing before the sight of God, which is part of the wine that Babylon and her daughters are getting the, the world drunk with. Jeremiah 32 verse 35, We've seen that the immortality of the soul is an abomination. To think that the law is no longer important is an abomination. To think that we can be saved by our works is, is, is an abomination. To think that we don't need the law is also an abomination. Fornication or adultery is an abomination. To think that we can eat or drink whatever we want also is an abomination. And here in Jeremiah 32 verse 35, the Bible says, And they built, here talking about, talk, talking about Israel, and they built the high places of Baal which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom to cause their sons and daughters to pass through the fire to Molech, which I did not command them, nor did I come into, nor did it come into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. To cause Judah to sin. Now you may be thinking, okay, I think you've gone a little bit overboard, Pastor. None of us are putting our children through the fire. I hope not. But what is the principle? What is the principle here in Jeremiah 32? Why were they putting their children through the fire. You see, the reason why people burn their children or offer them as a sacrifice to the gods is because they believe that the gods needed to be tamed, that the gods needed to be calmed, that you, that you needed to appease the god. And in order to appease a vengeful god, just give them a sacrifice. Burn your children, have them go through the fire, and that will appease the vengeance, the wrath of God. And friends, and that's an abomination. And in principle, any church that teaches that God is a vengeful God, ready to throw you into hell when you misbehave, is doing the same principle as here as in Jeremiah 32. Because they would take their children and throw them in the fire, thinking that they had to appease Moloch. And today, we people are throwing their children in the fire, thinking that they have to appease God from a fiery red burning hell which does not describe the true character of God and that is an abomination as well it actually points people away from God knowing that God is that vengeful and torturous and so that's why it's an abomination Homosexuality is also an, abom an, an abomination. Leviticus 18.22 tells us that you shall not lie with a man as you do with a woman. And the, the New Testament also tells us about homosexuality. But you want to know what the greatest abomination is? The greatest of them all. If you turn with me to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 8. We'll see the greatest abomination of them all. Ezekiel is right after Jeremiah. So you're there in Ezekiel chapter 8. Ezekiel chapter 8. Verses 15 and onward. 
Here God is giving, is, is, uh, is giving Ezekiel a vision and since the beginning of chapter 8 he's showing them all the abomination that Israel is doing. And here on, in, verse, in verse 15 it says, Then he said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? Turn again, you will see greater abominations than these. So he brought me into the inner courts of the Lord's house. Where is that? In the sanctuary. Okay, so they are in the sanctuary. In the inner courts of the Lord's house. And there at the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. And they were worshiping the sun toward the east. Then he said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? Is it a trivial thing to the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they commit here? You see, God here is so surprising. Even Ezekiel, he thinks he's seen, he thinks he's seen it all. And God says, you haven't seen nothing yet. Let me show you this. He takes him in vision and he sees these men in the temple of God, that their backs to the temple, facing the sun and worshiping the sun worshiping the sun worshiping the sun is an abomination also as we see here we could even go so far as to say that even worshiping the day of the sun is just as an abomination but some may say well it's not the same thing to worship the actual object than to worship on the day of the sun and I would respectfully disagree that in principle it is. In principle it is. Who created the sun? God did. Did he create it to, wor to, to, to be worshipped? So what happens if I turn an object that God made into an object of worship? It's called what? Idolatry. Right? We are worshipping something that God didn't intend to be worshipped. God says you, the, it's breaking the second commandment. So... In the same sense, who created the first day of the week? God did, yes. Did we forget? <laughs> God created the first day of the week. Did he make the first day of the week to be worship? No. no. So what happens if we turn the first day of the week into an object or a day of worship? It is called idolatry as well. It doesn't matter whether it's an object or a day. The principle is the same. The wine represents the counterfeit gospel. It represents both pagan practices and doctrines contrary to scripture that have come into the church. And some of these such are such as uh, Sunday observance, infant baptism, lighting candles, venerating the, the saints, bowing to idols, the rosary, Easter, celibacy, altars, Lent, penance, mass, doing signs of the cross, praying for the dead or to the dead, all of which none of these are found in scripture for us to practice. And all of these abominations are the wine that Babylon and her daughters, and her daughters, which they have given to drink to get the world drunk. But you see, if we go back to the second angel's message, there in Revelation chapter 14, praise the Lord that Babylon has fallen. Revelation 14. And there are much more abominations in scripture. That would be a good Bible study to do of all the abominations that God shares with us in his word. But there in Revelation 14, verse 8, and another angel follows saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. The great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. You see, why has she fallen? She has fallen because of the first angel's message. The first angel's message clarifies the confusion of Babylon and her daughters. And that's why she fell. The first angel's message exposes her falsehood. 
You see, ba while Babylon is feeding all of this wine to the world, there comes a time where the first angel's message begins to be preached. And it begins with William Miller and begin to be preaching about God's judgment to come. He begin to be preaching to fear God and give Him glory. He begins to be preaching that to fear Him, to give Him glory, the hour of His judgment has come, to worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, and the springs of water. And because of the first angel's message, that's why Babylon has fallen, because now the truth that the wine was all mixed with, with errors, the first angel's message makes it clear. The first angel's message says, hey, Babylon and her daughters have no leg to stand on because this is what thus says the Lord. This is what the Bible says about the immortality of the, of, the, of the soul. This is what the Bible says on who can forgive our sins. This is what the Bible says about the second coming of Jesus. A very good study is that you can find every single one of our pillars of our faith in the first angel's message. And so the first angel's message really knocks down all of the wine of Babylon. And that's why the, this second angel's message, because the first angel's message is being preached. And do you remember, as we saw there in Revelation 17, that you know, this, this harlot, Babylon, has made the whole world drunk, right? Nations, tongues, and people. But praise the Lord that that's why this first angel's message goes to every tongue, nation, people, everywhere as well. To clear it up for everyone about the true character of God. <clears throat> But unfortunately, friends, we live in a world where truth doesn't matter anymore. We just want to get along. We don't want to debate what is truth. And some may say, you know, it makes no difference. So I'd like, I like to invite you to see what God says there in 2 Thessalonians. If you look at 2 Thessalonians, open your Bible to 2 Thessalonians. Does truth matter? Or, you know, it, it, eh, Sunday, Friday, Saturday, heaven, hell, does it really matter? Well, there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, the Bible is clear, friends. It says there in verse 7, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restraints will do so until he is taken out of the way and then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming the coming of the lawless one is according to the works of Satan and with all power signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteousness deceptions among those who perish because and here's why here's why they perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved friends why are they lost not because God willed it that way but truth does matter friends that's why Jesus says in John 17 17 Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Your word is truth. And so this is why if you join me back to Revelation. Revelation chapter 18. Friend, this is why God is appealing to us today. In Revelation chapter 18 verse 1. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. There it is again. And has become the, a habitation of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, the kings. And the earth have committed fornication with her. 
and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. See, God is appealing. Babylon has fallen. That wine, that is confusion, that abomination that Babylon has been feeding you doesn't need to anymore because of the first angel's message. And at the same time here, God is calling, come out, come out of Babylon, my people. Notice, he says, my people. He doesn't say, come out to become my people. They are his people already. They are his people already. This means that God has people in those daughters of Babylon. That God has people in Babylon right now. And they are following according to their sincere heart up to the light that they know. And here God is appealing to them, come out my people. I don't want you to participate in the plagues that I'm going to pour out. Come out. Come out. He calls his people out of Babylon. If he is calling out, at the same time he is also calling in. You know, when Noah preached, he called people out of destruction. The world's going to be destroyed. Get out of the world and come into the ark if you want to be saved. And God is doing the same thing. He's calling people out of Babylon and into his last day remnant church. There, Revelation 14, in the last part of the third angel's message, in verse 12, it says, Here is a patient of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It's like if Paul, I'm sorry, John is, is looking, you know, there is Babylon and there is the wicked, but over here are the patient of the saints. Over here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. He's also appealing in Revelation 12 verse 17. You know, if the devil is angry at you, that's a good thing. Because here in Revelation 12, 17, it says the dragon was enraged with the woman. And I think enraged is an understatement. He is more than enraged with the woman, with the church. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. See, God is calling us out of Babylon and into his remnant church, friends. And I know some of you are studying the Bible because you want to be, called, you want to be part of God's remnant church. And you are taking steps to that. But I know also that there are some who have put it off. Who have put it off. And I just want to appeal to you. Friends, in times like these, as we're going to sing in a, in a little bit, you need a Savior. In times like these, you need an anchor that really holds. You see, the wine of Babylon, you know what wine is, right? It's not pure. It's fermented. It's mixed with truth and error. It's not 100% pure. And God is offering you pure truth. Pure truth. In times like this, you need a savior. In times like this, you need an anchor. So be very sure, be very sure your anchor holds on the solid rock. In times like these, you need the Bible. The Bible. In times like these, oh, do not be idle. But be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock, friends. In times like this, you need a church that is clear on a thus says the Lord. Amen. So I just want to appeal to everyone. 
May God help us to accept the truth as God, the, the truth of God and not the wine of Babylon. And if you have not accepted God's truth yet and would like to, there's a card in every single pew, a card with a prayer request card or another longer card. It doesn't matter if there's no card, you can rip a piece of your notebook paper. But if you would like to learn more of the truth of God, of the pure truth of God, not the mixture of the wine of Babylon, just put down your name and a contact. I would ask you to come to the front, but that might hold you back. So just put your name and a contact, and my son will be in the back with a tray and just drop it off on that, in that little tray. Friends, we will soon see how important it is because the next angel's message, which is the third angel's message, will give us the results if we do not come 100% into a relationship with Jesus Christ and into his truth. And friends, I, I do not want to see anyone go through that. Now, I have no enemies, but even if I did, not even my enemies would I want them to go to that. Friends, Jesus is coming very soon. He is wrapping this thing up. But he is giving the message, the clear message of the first angel's message all around the world. And is also giving us the clear message that Babylon and her abominations, her wine, they're fallen because of the truth of the first angel's message. Praise the Lord. So I just appeal to you. If you have not accepted God's truth, if you have not come out of Babylon and into God's church, into God's remnant people, to do so. If you want to just find out information, what is even God's remnant? What is he talking about? Just put down your name. I am not here to twist your arm to join the church. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I just want to share with you the truth of God and the Holy Spirit will direct you where to go. Father in heaven, Lord my God, thank you very much because you have shown us the wine of Babylon, but thank you very much because it is fallen. It has no leg to stand on, but your truth is the rock. Your son, Jesus Christ, is our rock. And I just appeal to anyone here that maybe has not made that decision, that you be with them. That you prick their hearts even more. And anyone that may be trying to distract them and anything that the devil may be trying to interrupt them from making that decision, please, Lord, remove that. And convict any heart that needs repentance, but convict any heart that needs to search your truth. To write down just their name and a contact number. Thank you, Father. And Lord, all I can do is appeal but you do all the work and your spirit does all the work. Thank you, Lord, for answering my prayer. Be with your church. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.